Uh, good morning, everybody. How are you? How are you? <laughs> Everybody's tired. Dinner was good. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, you know, I had completely forgotten I was at the the very first one. I just I speak and try to share as much knowledge as I can around the world. But uh, yeah, I guess it was three. It was four or five years ago where I started uh, looking around at how to. Because I was founder of White Hat Security, and I was trying to find ways to. Uh, find more AppSec talent around the world or places where we can grow um, because we ran out of technologists in the US. And uh, there's a, an entity out here in, uh, in Northern Ireland called uh, InvestNI, many of you know the name. And from uh, just a US perspective, I'm gonna t I have to tell you how much of a, a credit they are to your country and it's really why, why we came here because when we came here there was AppSec really just wasn't here at all. And we saw the people here, the talent, the area, and you know, I just fell in love with it and uh, opened up shop here and you know, started to present and uh, help out the chapter out here and the people here, and they took it from there. And uh, a couple of years later, look at you guys, you guys are rivaling AppSec USA. So uh, this is a, an amazing thing for me to walk into in this and, uh, and help out with and then come back and share some more stuff. So uh, while this is a keynote for an application security conference, I'm only gonna touch a little bit on application security from my perspective, I was doing it for 15 years. Um, about a year and a half ago, I left White Hat Security just to pursue other interests. Uh, mostly on the malware side, uh, specifically because the way my customers were getting compromised is they would get compromised through the website, probably a website that they didn't know they even had. And from an attacker's perspective, once you get a foothold onto the network, you move laterally and you implant customized malware and you start doing whatever damage. So I wanted to be one step further in the kill chain. And uh, one of the topics I grabbed onto was uh, ransomware. And because uh, I saw the numbers and I'll get into all this stuff. And one of the things when I research a topic, I like following the money, the trends and alignment of interest. And I'll talk a lot about, about that um, as we go. You guys are more than welcome to ask questions at any time as we go, but I'm gonna go really fast. And I'm gonna share a whole lot of data. Um, while I've been CTO, CEO, a couple of times, um, I consider myself more than anything, just a professional hacker. I like breaking stuff. I like breaking software. It's something I've always done since I was 12. Um, black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, in case I ever get in close proximity of a bad guy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I guess there's one Jiu-Jitsu guy in the audience. And, uh, and part of my job, my mission, my crusade, and I advocate everybody else to do the same, is to share knowledge as, as you can, because that's how we help out. That's how we grow. That's, that's how we do our job well. So I've given nearly 400 public presentations around the world. Um, I do less and less of these as I go, because uh, just have a lacking amount of time. So uh, I only do a handful each year. So if you see me some places, because I really like the people, really like the place, and I think I can make an impact. So to get started, I wanna talk about a personal experience I had many, many years ago. It's only a story I've told a couple of times publicly. And it's not something I try to keep quiet. It's just something that never really came up and you'll understand why. So my first uh, real experience with cyber extortion, which wasn't ransomware, but it was online extortion, was back in 2005. So for those that don't know the history, I started White Hat right around 2002. And uh, just after uh, a couple of years, I did at Yahoo. And I sank my, uh, my life savings, hundreds of thousands of dollars in this new company called White Hat Security that was gonna change AppSec forever, define the space really. And uh, we're about two or three years in, we had this SaaS platform, I had 20 or 30 very large customers on the system, we were doing extremely well. And uh, one day we walk in, and this is a copy and pasted version, this was on our servers. Um, I thought somebody had, was playing a joke on us. We come in, we log into our Linux systems, and this was on the screen. And I'm looking around the office, okay, what jerk did this, right? And uh, we started investigating a little bit more, and this was legit. Someone had rooted our systems and uh, claimed to have access to all of our data. This is vulnerability data from Fortune 500 companies. This is a nightmare scenario. That is what our extortion letter looked like. So the person had claimed that had access to all of our systems, our source code, and all of customer data. So you kind of imagine that uh, what a nightmare scenario this is. Quickly running the scenarios around in my head, trying to figure out this is legit. 
I'm gonna summarize real quick. It was a legit scenario. I asked for proof of data. I got it. And the way they got in is we had a, a jump box that was publicly available that where we messed up, we had an oversight on it and it was compromised. They gave a conduit into our development environments remotely and for there they leapfrog into production. So once they rooted the jump box, they waited us for, to, for us to SSH in and they compromised our credentials and that's really how it worked. So it was our mistake. So now you're in this, you're in this very tenuous position. Of course, we have to notify our customers. We are not going to go without doing that. Um, but we're preparing for the worst. Like, we're going to have to close up shop here. There's no way anybody's going to trust us after this. So let me tell you firsthand, you've not completed your education in security until you've had to make 30 phone calls to your customers and telling that their vuln data is exposed by a third party. So you have to make 30 personal phone calls. So we downed all of our systems, burnt all the data to DVDs, shipped them off. So we, the customers, we can give them the play-by-play -play and everything we possibly could do so they could protect themselves while we clean up the mess. I'm talking to the FBI, and now we get into this moral ethical dilemma. Do you pay the bad guy or do you not? They ask for payments of $5,000 per week until you get to the requisite $15,000 amount. Now, I do not want to pay this particular person, obviously, um, but I decided it was in the best interest of our customers that we did so because if I pay them $5,000, hopefully it gives my customers a week of time um, to protect themselves. So I made two payments of $5,000 using eGold, for those that remember, and I, I skipped out on the third because the person went uh, uh, incommunicado, and, uh, and that was that, and I never heard from them again. So. What was interesting that happened while we got hacked, and security companies do get hacked sometimes, everybody makes a mistake, it taught me a couple important lessons. The first and foremost, this will never, ever happen again. You know, so that was our really wake up moment. Uh, second, that if you act with integrity, with transparency, particularly with your customers, they'll stick by you. A year later, Years later, we had every single one of those customers, not a single one of them left us. While they were disappointed and frustrated, they are nonetheless were pragmatic and say sometimes shit happens, and they stuck with us because they know we were credible and that we were gonna treat them with respect every single step of the way. Now, let's flash forward. Um, as I'm exiting y trying to figure out what I wanna do next, um, I came across this particular stat. Um, 2015, uh, ransomware is really starting to take hold, and as I'll go through, it's not a new thing. This stat came out from the FBI, and the FBI will request that small businesses, when they have to pay extortion demands in ransomware, that you report the amount. Over 2015, it was $24 million in over the entire year of 2015. In 2016, just Q1, it ballooned to over $200 million. Right there, I'm looking at it, staring at you, just do the math. It's a brand new billion dollar cybercrime industry being born right before your eyes and no one's doing anything about it. It's going to happen. So when I personally want to make an impact, I saw opportunity there and go, I think I can do something about this. And I jumped at the chance and went forward. For those that are not immediately aware of the history of ransomware, this is not a new phenomenon. The first known recorded instance of ransomware, unless you you go by Cliff Stoll's book, uh, The Cuckoo's Egg. This is the first known one, according to Wikipedia, 1989, something called the AIDS virus. These five and a quarter floppies, I know many of you have never seen one unless you're of a certain age. <laughs> um, these were 20,000 of these were printed. Um, they were mailed out. Uh, it had something to do with the UN. And the only way to pay it was to drop uh, dollars in an envelope and ship them off. Now, that's part of you know, ancient InfoSec folklore history. Those disks, there were 20,000 originals, and about a year ago, I started trying to hunt them down. I tried to contact the original author. He is now deceased, so that went nowhere. And I finally came across one person that had an original. This is Eddie. Eddie has an original with the instructions. It's the only known one in existence that survived. Yes, we can manufacture new ones, but I wanted an original. So if anybody happens to know who has an original, I have $1,000 for you. <laughs> These are now collector's items. Um, this is what ransomware looks like. These are the actual extortion letters that will appear on the screen. They're all different shapes and sizes, and what they prey upon is your fear, your anxiety, and they want you to get really, really nervous and pay quickly in the highest sum possible. It's in their best interests. This ransomware stuff impacts any number of industries now. Nothing seems to be safe. Not the medical care uh, industry, not education, people, hotels. And we're going to go through some examples, but every single 
a person in business that relies upon the internet or has data there is now at risk. And I am not, it's hard to overstate this fact. So I'm gonna go through a couple examples so this sears into your mind what it is that we're dealing with. Um, this was a mistaken infection on an LG smart TV that was running the Android operating system. It got infected with ransomware and basically it said, pay the ransom or we're gonna keep your TV. The difficulty with the technologist, and this was an IT person who had an infection, was they called up support, and the only way to reset the machine was to get the firmware password, which support at LG, they didn't have any idea what he was talking about. So he had to go through docs and try to recover this machine. But this is kind of a, an IoT instance of ransomware that will move forward. This is one, this is a slightly humorous. <laughs> this is a ransomware extortion instance where someone got infected with a piece of ransomware, it recorded them in an intimate moment, and then the extortion demand was you will pay us $10,000 or we will send this video onto your Facebook account and embarrass you forever and ever. And for a college student with not a whole lot of uh, money or means, this was an interesting moment. Do you pay or do you not pay? And that gets very, very personal. I have no idea what happened, the story went cold, but that's what's going on out there. Um, this was another example that hit the hotel industry. Uh, a piece of ransomware uh, infected for the third time the, the key card system at a hotel where occupants or guests could leave the room, but they could not get back into it. Um, so the hotel had contracted their key card system out to a third party. It's not like they designed an IT key card system themselves. And they had finally got fed up with having to pay this stuff and recover, and they are now moving back to physical key system because they're sick of IT. <laughs> um, here's one that hit close to home because uh, you know I was uh, I'm from the Bay Area or not from the Bay Area, I used to live there for a long time when running White Hat. Um, this is a ransomware attack that infected a few thousand machines on the ticketing system on the San Francisco Muni bus and train system. While all the transportation was able to run flawlessly, um, there was no way to pay for tickets on the bus rides over the weekend. And so rather than shut it down, they just let all the, uh, all the riders go for free, which cost them hundreds of thousands of dollars. They fortunately didn't have to recover, uh, they didn't have to pay the extortion because they had backups, but the ticketing system was down for uh, several days while they cleaned up the mess. Increasing in risk, this was a particularly interesting story that didn't make much, uh, didn't get much notoriety, I'm not exactly sure why. During the inauguration, I wanna read this headline for you here. Ransomware killed 70% of Washington, D.C.'s closed-circuit TV cameras ahead of the inauguration. 70% of their cameras were blind during the inaugurations because there was a ransomware infection on these devices eight days out from our election. It's kind of concerning, isn't it? And no one noticed till way after the fact, so no one was actually minding the shop or watching the cameras anyway. Another story here, this is where ransomware took down a... a a local city, a municipality, and 911 services, emergency services were impacted where they couldn't send uh, ambulances or law enforcement out uh, to victims who needed help. So now we're talking lives are at risk. This one here uh, had to do with the infection of a local police station in the US. And if you think, if you set aside that it's a local police station, it's just a small company with a small IT shop and maybe an IT person, maybe. And all the data you know, that we take for granted is all live historical and live investigation data on their network. So eight years of investigations data, including active investigation, becomes encrypted. Now, due to the, let's just say it, the incompetency of the IT system and the guidance that they were getting from law enforcement, they decided not to pay because they thought they had backups and decided to overwrite using old backups over the encrypted data, hoping everything would be okay. As it often happens for many of the IT people in the room that have done this stuff, the backups failed they didn't work properly, and they said, okay, no problem, we'll pay, but the encrypted data was now gone. <laughs> they had overwritten it. And so they lost eight years worth of investigations data, and criminals are now going to walk because of a ransomware infection. This is the world in which we live. And the last one I'll give you here, this one hit closer to here, but this was the National Health Trust. Um, the, invest, uh, the infection hit four hospitals, and they, had a, they cut it off because they cut access to all the remaining hospitals. But in the aftermath, 2,800 uh, 2, patient appointments had to be rescheduled 
as a part of the infection. I forget if they paid or not in this case, but imagine for a moment that computer security is now affecting patient care. We can't have this stuff. This is gonna cost loss. It's probably unavoidable at this point, but there's gonna be loss of life as a direct result of ransomware, and I'm personally gonna do what I can to stop this, but this is, the, uh, this is our operational considerations. Now, I've given you a ton of anecdotes. I wanna give you some uh, quick amounts of data so it's not just headline news stuff. I'm gonna run through these really quickly. It's from a bunch of different vendors and they'll all tell the same message. Uh, ransomware is a major, major problem. 70% uh, of enterprises, 70% uh, of enterprise ransomware victims pay up and you don't immediately think for a moment that they just should have had backups because that's a faulty assumption. And I wanna explain this really well. So imagine you're a hospital or any business that's operating 24 by seven, because that's what we do online, and you have backups. And the business, and all of a sudden you get a massive outbreak, a massive infection, and, and the business says to IT, do you have backups, can we restore? IT says, yeah, absolutely, it'll take three days. Or you can pay the ransom and be up in 20 minutes which do you do, right? And that's, that's the reality is. That's why so many companies are paying even though they have backups. Um, the ransomware payments are anywhere from the individual computers, moms and dads computers, probably around $500 to $2,000. And the, the SMEs or the enterprises are paying anywhere from ten dollars to $50,000, but it's in that range. Um, same thing for Sentinel-1, we ran a survey. We're asking customers their experiences with ransomware. So far, 50% of organizations have responded to a ransomware campaign and it's increasing, and if they've paid once, they'll pay again, so there's reinfection rates because they still are unable to secure their systems properly. Um, the one more I'll give you from Kaspersky, they've been seeing a threefold increase from January to September. This was in, taken in uh, December 2016, so the problem is getting worse. And going by Kaspersky's uh, intelligence, 75% of the ransomware is coming out of Russia, so those are our adversaries. I go on Twitter, and like I do, is I ask basic questions online, I pontificate, and I ask online, when are we gonna see the first six-figure ransom payday? Because ransom amounts are going up, they're in five figures, when are we gonna see the sixth one? And right there at the bottom, you see Richard Baitlick, he's a professional incident responder. Um, at the time, he was working for FireEye, but he's been doing incident response a long time, and he said to me he was aware already of a seven-figure uh, ransom payment. I asked him a little bit more. He couldn't tell me many of the details. The two that he told me was it was a law firm that was completely down, completely compromised, no backups. They couldn't respond to actions, contracts, anything. They were dead as a business until they paid. So when you're running a mega law firm and it's gonna cost you a million dollars to get back in business, you pay it. And that's what they did. All right, let's, uh, let's go through some of the things we've learned so far. Not all critical systems are backed up. We know this implicitly. We gotta get better at that. Um, and I'll say this one directly. Your antivirus software sucks. Doesn't work. And uh, which is why when I got into the space and joined Sentinel One, I thought their, their software did work and uh, that we can make a difference. Um, the infection rates are still rising out there for a variety of reasons. We have rising ransom demands. The bad guys are demanding more and more because they can. Um, CFOs and their law firms are now starting to get educated on, a bit, on Bitcoin because here's what happens. In a time-based transaction like ransomware, the last thing you want your CFO saying is, in a ransomware infection is, what's a Bitcoin? That just slows everything down. And what at least a lot of the US companies are doing now is they're asking their third-party law firms to hold Bitcoins as a retainer in the event that they have to pay or infection. Because what happens is in the event of infection, you don't want your wallet or credentials to your wallet to be encrypted also. So they're asking the law firm to keep that at arm's length. Um, we're seeing innovation in business models and ransomware, which we'll get into more. And this is where we're gonna spend a good amount of time for the rest of the discussion talking about cyber insurance and reimbursement in the era of ransomware because their business models and their risk models apply really interestingly. And this is where we start learning from, uh, from, from physical space. This is where we move to kidnapping and ransom, the real stuff, you know, when you kidnap people and you hold them for ransom. And so right now, we, in the industry, they call it KNR for short, and it's a reportedly a $500 million market, meaning uh, hijacking cargo, stealing executives and holding them for ransom, nets $500 million or so per year. So I start researching this space to see some parallels and maybe the way the economics in this world work can apply and help me understand where ransomware is heading. So I start my research. 
I want to keep it fun for myself. Start downloading some, some movies and watching Netflix and uh, see Proof of Life and you know, Ransom and all kinds of cool movies. And the interesting thing is, is while, while Hollywood movies are dramatized, um, they were nonetheless fairly accurate in, uh, in how ransomware works and how the k &R industry works. And uh, one of the stories that I liked was, had nothing to do with this stuff here, but it goes back to uh, Julius Caesar because uh, kidnapping and ransom is the oldest time. So this is what a, uh, well, the kind of guy, the OG that uh, Julius Caesar was. At 25 years old, he's this uh, very rich you know, military general, you know, businessman, very wealthy, and he gets kidnapped at 25 by Sicilian pirates. No, so he gets kidnapped and they want a 25 talent ransom of silver. And that translates to roughly a quarter million dollars. Being the, the arrogant type guy that he is, he laughs in their faces and he says, I'm worth far more than that. You should really ask for 50. <laughs> so they say, okay. And uh, during his stay, because they have to send letters back and forth and negotiate like that, um, he is, uh, starts to bark orders at the, uh, at the hostage takers, at his, uh, at his captives, at his captors, I should say. And uh, he's writing poetry and reciting poetry to them. He's telling them to be quiet during nap times and all these sorts of things. <laughs> and, uh, and finally, um, you know, his business interests, his friends and colleagues, they raise the money and they pay the 50 talents of silver and they let him go. Um, shortly thereafter, he hunts down uh, the Sicilian pirates and has them all crucified. So that's how that story ends. <laughs> Another interesting one was a, uh, this was not too long ago, this was a Taiwanese billionaire who was uh, kidnapped. And while this alone was not terribly unique or even interesting, the $1.68 million ransom that was paid and he was released was paid out in Bitcoin, not in cash. So that was pretty interesting. Um, so that we're going to see a shift there in KNR, stealing, uh, borrowing from cryptocurrency, because it's much easier for the bad guys to get away with Bitcoin. And then I happen to stumble across two independent stories, one in what's called Planet Money from NPR in the U.S., and the other one was covered by Wired, and they started to research the actual business and business model behind high seas piracy. I didn't know it at the time. High seas piracy is an actual thing. There are pirates in the world that will take over vessels and ransom the cargo. And so what most people don't know is most of modern day pirates are Somali fishermen. And let me read this one. Our, our fishermen who traded nets for guns, they've learned that ransom is more profitable than robbery. And rather than squandering their loot, they reinvest in equipment and training. Now, you might ask yourself, why would a fisherman risk life and limb you know, for, you know, for piracy. Well, consider the fact that a Somali fisherman earns about $600 a year, and in a successful hijacking, they can net about $10,000, and that they already live in Somalia, they're gonna, they do this work, and they're ha quite happy to do so. And so they, they join a pirate or piracy organization. The way the, the economics work in this model let me just read this one. Fewer than one in three hijack attempts is successful. A savvy captain can ward off the marauders by maneuvering the ship to create a turbulent wake because these high-speed skiffs don't draw much water, so they'll flip over if they go too fast and get too close to the ships. And then there's a 15-minute time window that everybody knows about, both the ship and the pirates, to get on board for two reasons. One, in the 15-minute window, if you go beyond that, there's enough time for one of the navies to come by with a helicopter gunship to literally blow you out of the water. And then if you happen to get on the ship, the crews are trained because no one wants to die. It's just, you know, it's just money that the crews are trained to give up and offer no resistance. And the pirates knows that, which is why there's very little loss of life in high seas piracy because everybody knows the rules and they abide by the rules. Now, I'm going to go through the business model behind the scenes, and you'll, you'll think I made this stuff up. I did not. This is actually how it works. There are investors in high seas piracy, and a high seas piracy operation, the investors will put down fifty dollars to $250,000 for, for the staff, personnel, and intelligence that they need. The crews will require 12 to 24 men to take, uh, take over a ship, depending on its size and its cargo. And then they need equipment in the form of speedboats, large ships to launch the skips to extend the range. Um, they need caterers, even pirates have to eat. Um, you need ladders, ropes, intelligence, because you have to know where the ships are and what they're carrying. Of course, you need weapons and communications like walkie-talkies to communicate amongst the bad guys, land, and, from your, and to your victims. 
You need to select the targets by cargo, owner, and port of origin because not all, not all cargo is created equal and not all kidnapping victims are created equal. Certain nationalities are worth more than others in piracy. <laughs> and then um, you ha need to have, once you get the cash, you need a trustworthy financial system, which in this case happens to be the Islamic banking network in order to put your cash in a bank, launder it so you can actually keep it. That's the money flow. Now, who are the participants in this, uh, in this business? First, you have the tribal elders in Somalia that uh, they control the land-based operations for who operates in and out of Somalia. You have the financiers who come up with the cash. These are the investors. Um, you have the commander, the person who, this is the captain, this is who runs the piracy operation. They need a security squad to protect them, the equipment, and the operational. You need the mother mothership and its crew for all the skiffs, so you have to recruit. And then you need English-speaking negotiators that are land-based, who so have nothing to do with the operation, that all they, because you know, a, Somali, a Somali fisherman doesn't know how to speak English, can't, doesn't have any background in negotiating anything, so they have professional ransom negotiators on the pirate side that take a cut. Now, in piracy, um, the process may take days, weeks, or months, sometimes years, this is important, it's in everybody's best interest for it for this uh, to be over quickly because it, any the more time that goes on, you increase the likelihood of loss of life or damaging the cargo in some way. Um, negotiations on both sides are handled by a crisis management team and professional K and R negotiators. You'll see this right out of the Hollywood movies. You actually there's a person that you call. It's usually ex-military, ex-intelligence on the insurance side. So when there's a kidnapping, you call the crisis hotline. They fly a negotiator out to wherever they need to go, and they start talking with the uh, with the Somali or the land-based negotiator um, to strike a deal. There cannot be any supernormal profits, and we'll get into more of that, what that means, but they try to keep the ransom demands within market norms. The last thing anybody wants is an over-anxious victim um, that's paying too much too quickly because it, it will forever impact everybody else going forward. How they do the transaction is a little interesting in piracy. They literally take mountains of cash and $100 bills they put it inside of buoys and they throw it overboard into the ocean with a GPS on a from a helicopter gunship. Then the, then the Somalis will, or the pirates or whoever they were from, they'll grab the cash, count it, and then they'll take it on, and they'll grab it and they'll count it, and then they have to get away with the cash. So a lot of times the vessel that they've hijacked will drop them off back on shore because they have to also get away from other pirates and the Navy who's going to blow them out of the water. So it's a little dangerous. Now, after you get your cash, um, you have to reimburse your suppliers for all your equipment. The financiers get 30 to 70 percent of the multi-million dollar take. The tribal elders uh, that I mentioned before, that have for anchoring rights, they take five to 10 percent of the cut, and the crew gets the remaining uh, part of the booty. That's how it's all divvied up. On the prevention side, because we just talked about the attacker side, on the prevention side, again, these are the things that we learn from uh, red team, blue team, in SPAC and cyber is that there's armed private security guards aboard these uh, vessels that operate in the region, you know, people with M16s. Um, you, the shippers will harden their vessels and take, are be trained to take evasive actions, serpentine motions, put large fences, razor wire, uh, you know, of course, uh, weaponry, and also uh, water cannons to, you know, to uh, mess with the skiffs. Um, there's also a change in the policy in Somalia to make it easier to deal with it. So again, we get into cybersecurity policy. That is very helpful. I'm going to read this fourth one a little verbatim here. Preemptive action by combined navies in the region. What does that mean? That means they've used helicopter gunships to go into the Somali coastline to blast all the skiffs and the boats and all their equipment, which worked because after they did that, it cut down piracy by 80% in the region for the next year. So I'll be careful when saying this, but it's quite possible that hacking back works. <laughs> And uh, this is a, a new addition I put in there when I'm researching the topic. Britney Spears has actually become a defensive measure. I kid you not. <laughs> Apparently, a Somali fisherman hates Western music, Western culture. And so there's a great video on YouTube. You see a helicopter gunship blaring, baby, hit me one more time, to the Somali pirates. <laughs> and they'll turn around because they hate this stuff. <laughs> Some of you can relate. <laughs> um, 
in the, in the Gulf Wars, I was reading even Eminem and other pop culture music was used. Um, it was used against uh, you know, some rebel force. They were blasting Eminem for like 20 straight days on full blast, and they, they had to be, they had to be uh, assisted for psychological trauma afterwards. <laughs> so uh, now if you want to maybe, maybe can help me translate this tactic to cyber, I'm all ears. I would love to make a ransomware operator have to listen to blaring Britney Spears music as they hack you. <laughs> so. All right, so now we've covered ransomware, we've covered k &R. Now let's get into a little bit of the insurance side because we'll start running through some models. Um, for kidnapping and ransom insurance, so if you operate in the oil industry in South America or you're in the shipping and receiving or the oil industry off the coast of Somalia, you're gonna want k &R insurance because they have the data and they'll help reimburse you for different costs as a result. What I didn't know at the time of the research, that k and insurance dates back to 1932 after the result of the Lindbergh baby kidnapping. But it really didn't come into vogue until the 70s. Now, I'll, I won't even bore you with the, uh, the Wikipedia stuff, on the, but uh, it, it covers a whole lot of costs with not only ransom demands, but uh, the crisis management team and so on and so forth. But this stuff is really treated like a gamble. What the insurance business knows is that some ships will be hijacked forcing them to dispense multi-million dollar settlements. However, they also know that the chance of this happening is minuscule, and which by their calculations makes it worth the policy. So they do the math, and they're, they're able to collect enough insurance premiums to pay for the cost of which vessels that they have to pay out ransoms on, and they do very well for themselves. Who offers this stuff? Um, AIG, Travelers, it's a boutique type of insurance, but all the major guys offer it. It's the exact same companies that offer cyber insurance today. So here's the rub. These models, these risk models that they use for K&R insurance should apply to ransomware insurance, which they already provide. So the risk models are already there, which is why I'm learning from those guys what we should be doing to counteract this threat. When you get K&R coverage, these are the costs. Um, these are the claims that you can make for the ransom amount, transportation costs to get people in and out of country, accidental death and, death and dismemberment, you know, legal liability, medical expenses because sometimes people get hurt, the crisis response team, lost wages, replacement personnel costs, it's a little gr grisly, and the polite way of saying the extortionist bounty is the money that you spend to go, just like Julius Caesar, to hunt down the bad guys and kill them. That is part of the reimbursement you get from K&R Insurance. Here's one of the most important things in the entire presentation. This is the economics of the model, how it's going to work in ransomware, just like it works on k and insurance. All k and insurance is either written or reinsured at Lloyd's of London. Within the Lloyd's of London market, there are 20 firms or syndicates competing for business. They all conduct resolutions according to clear rules. The Lloyd's Corp can exclude any syndicate that deviates from the established protocol and imposes costs on others. Outsiders, third-party insurance firms, do not have the necessary information to price kidnapping insurance correctly. So the insurance uh, people are, are gonna get all the ransomware actuarials, and when they, have uh, when they have ransomware insurance, they're gonna negotiate on your behalf and keep you within market norms because that protects them and every other forward-looking victim. When you want K&R insurance, it's about 500 a year, maybe as high as 50,000 depending on the coverage. Very important, policy confidentiality. You're not allowed to tell anybody you have K&R insurance because it makes you a higher, more attractive target, which is why cyber insurance and, and ransomware insurance policies, same thing. You're not allowed to tell anybody you have these policies. Ransoms are reimbursed, not paid out directly, and you have customer training, which means how not to get kidnapped and what to do in the event that you are kidnapped. So, what does all this so far, how does it blend together? What are the actual similarities between k &R and ransomware? One is you have a sentient adversary. When you are the victim, you know it, unlike traditional malware, which tries to hide itself just for command and control purposes. Time is always on the adversary side. They have all the time in the world. The victims do not. Um, the adversaries leverage fear and anxiety to the nth degree. The more fear and anxiety they can put into you, the higher the fee and the faster they'll get paid. In economics, the model is a bilateral monopoly, meaning there's only exactly one buyer and exactly one seller. Um, there's no one else you can sell your kidnapping victims to, and there's no one else who will buy them. So everybody's 
incentivized economically to make a deal happen, which is why deals are made, and very little loss of life. Um, the market value of the asset is subjective and there's very little info, which is why there's a Lloyd syndicate. The victims are targeted, but not always in ransomware. Um, and if adversaries break an agreement, they'll ruin the business for everybody. And so while we read a lot in the news that there's no guarantee that the ransomware operators will give you the key, by and large they actually do, just like in the KNR space, because it's, for them it's not a one and done. This is, an, this is an ongoing, sustainable business model, and so they're gonna give you the key. What are the differences? Because they're notable. Ransomware requires far less on front costs and logistics. It's less risky. Um, the, the, the data is not a witness. That's very nice. Ransomware scales, billion dollar industry. And the negotiation process is way faster, usually taking two to three days because the transaction is in Bitcoin. Um, and the ransom is easier to pay logistically. So we mentioned that. So uh, what we see in the ransomware campaigns is that they're increasingly professionalized and funded, just like in KNR. You're gonna have investors, tool writers, negotiators on the defense side. So there's actually, there's actually a, there's a few people that I've run into now who are now professional ransomware negotiators that are part of the crisis management teams. Very weird job. Um, you have the cyber insurance that required to keep the ransomware policy secret. We talked about this. And then adversaries will increasingly target the backup systems obviously because they target your backup systems that are probably in, uh, are accessible on the device, um, they'll increase the likelihood that you'll pay by wiping out the backup systems, like Dropbox or the network attached storage and things like that. Now, after this is all said and done, I have to give you some actionable intelligence so when you go back to your organizations or you run across this stuff, how do you best protect, uh, def uh, prepare yourselves or defend yourselves. One is backups, of course backups. Um, you also want to test your backups, and then you want to store archive backups that are not attached to the network at all to protect them. Um, and then, in the event of infection, do not blow away your encrypted backups before you test the, the restoration process. Um, one of the large New York banks that I ran into, one of the things that they do to prevent inf infection, hacking, and even ransomware is that in their entire operation is virtualized and they also almost get trigger happy. Anytime they think there's an infection, they just reset from a VM. Every single physical machine in the enterprise that people walk up to is a VM. That's just how they do it. Um, third one here is patch. Yes, patch, we know patching. But most we don't talk enough about is disabling macros in Office. Uh, that's a very, very big deal. Most organizations, or certain, only very few people in those organizations need macros. Macros are a leading way of infection and ransomware. Because what happens is you get a doc in the email, somebody clicks on it, there's actually no malware in the doc, it download, the macro downloads it live, which is why it beats all the AV. And uh, then you get infected because ransomware doesn't need root, you don't need an exploit, and you encrypt all the devices. And so there's no signature, there's no malware, there's no binary and you're done, so disable those things. Uh, fortunately, in the new Microsoft Office, you have more fine-grained controls over macros and what they can do, use them. Um, we're gonna need help from law enforcement to investigate and, uh, and arrest uh, the ransomware gangs, so strike back can help. Um, we're gonna need formation of syndicates for ransomware pricing so these costs don't get out of control. I think the last thing any of us wants is uh, the norm is a seven-figure payout to become the norm. We cannot have this because these guys will be reinvesting their ill-gotten gains into more and more ever-increasing and sophistication ransomware and their operations. So they're going to reinvest. And then we're going to have to listen to our cyber insurance overlords coming up forward. We're going to have all the actuarial data. If we're going to want can, uh, ransomware or any insurance from them, we're going to have to play by their rules. Or that's it. I'm gonna give you one more slide here and then I'll close. Um, in 2010, back to KNR, 148 million of ransoms were paid to, were paid to pirates. On the other hand, $1.85 billion were spent on insurances to cover piracy. That's 10 times more than the actual ransoms that were given to pirates. So, for the vendors that are in the room, you're in a good spot. <laughs> All right. So we've gone back and forth, but uh, one of the things I like to always express and share, because I find this to be really, really important, is that the InfoSec industry collects $81 billion every single year, and the results are everybody gets hacked all the time. 
we can do better than this. And I think, let me, let me lay it out here. How much time do I have left? Uh, seven minutes, okay. Now, we're at a software security conference, and we'll, we can debate over the finer points, but I think as a collective, we know how to make secure software, at least secure enough software. In the same way, I think we know how to make hosts reasonably secure. We know how to patch and configure them and lock them down. We know how to make networks locked down, at least secure enough, more than any other enterprise does. And so when I was looking at the problem of this, and, and I've been looking at this for several years, we have enough know-how, technical know-how collectively, to make our systems a thousand times more secure than they are today. But I think you'll agree that we just don't for whatever reason. We don't have the stomach for it, or the business doesn't have the funds for it, or doesn't want us to. So the, we're not really dealing with a technological problem where we need more know-how. We need motivation. We have misaligned incentives in the market. And been, being a vendor for the last 15 years, I've been a culprit in this. What happens is every single security vendor is inclined to try to over-embellish what it is they can do for the customer, and whoever can have the best marketing or advertising in the industry wins. And what happens is on the customer side, they pick the best vendor that they can, and it's really tough to distinguish. When you get hacked through AV, through your scanner, through your WAF, or your whatever, when you get hacked and you have a loss, the vendor is hands off. They just basically say, sucks to be you. We have an $81 billion industry, and there's no warranties to be found anywhere, and we do not tolerate this in any other space. You can't buy a car this way, you can't buy electronics this way, you can't buy a shirt this way. Everything except software and security comes with some kind of warranty, except what we do. And I cannot find a great reason why we do this. And so what I've been spending the last year of my life on, on is designing uh, security vendor warranties and helping others design them. Last year there was three or four, um, and I designed two of them. Um, now it's up to 17 or 18 on the market. And so I'm starting to increase the supply of warranties. And what I, one of the things I ask of you is to start asking your vendors to what they think about offering a warranty and that you're interested in having your, in, your interests align with theirs. Let them be in lockstep. You don't have to demand it, just ask them about it. If they want to claim a great WAF, they want to tell you how effective it is, let them warranty it. Same with the scanners, sort, DAST or SAFT or whatever, start asking them for it. We owe it to ourselves to, uh, to do this and it's an okay thing. We have to have a cultural change here. These warranties can be insurance backed just like in the, in the, in the event of uh, k and and that's where I've been spending a lot of my time because I find if I'm gonna make an impact, it's not gonna be on, a t on the means of technolog technological means of making an impact, moving the needle because we already know enough. The way I'm gonna make an impact, the way I hope you will help me make an impact is changing the incentives model, making vendors accountable for what they say and what they do, just like I held myself to account 15 years ago now. And uh, with that, I really appreciate your time and, your my, uh, and the opportunity to be up here, and I hope to keep coming back year over year and watch this thing, uh, watch you guys grow and the industry grow out here. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we have about five minutes for questions. If anybody has questions, I don't know how you want to handle it. Uh, yes, in the back. Yeah. Oh, sure. Okay. So the question was, of those who paid the ransom, what percentage of them did not get their data back? The key didn't work or the bad guy d didn't do what they said they're going to do? It happens from time to time. And depending on the sampling size or who you ask, it happens. But it, it doesn't happen a lot. Um, I know that it encourages people to pay. I don't get into the ethics of it. I let people choose their own ethics. I, I like going by the data. Um, it happens. It's just not often. Yes, sir. What, one more, what, oh, oh. what insurances or, or proofs of having the data does one require from the it's a, it's a, yeah, It's a great question. So you get infected with ransomware. How do you, well, the thing is, in the case of ransomware, the bad guy actually doesn't have the data. They didn't do exfiltration. What you want to know is that they actually have the key to unlock the data. So if you're an enterprise, usually it's not just one machine that got infected. You probably have a few dozen or a hundred. 
Um, ask them for a single key so you can make sure it's the right person and they have the key and then it does unlock so now you get proof of data and then you can start paying the lump sum that they want to get the remainder keys for the rest of the data. That is one way to handle it. Um, in, in my particular case, when, uh, when I was at White Hat, I asked for proof of data, so I asked just for uh, you know, 100 records from the database, and yeah, it was legit. Yes? All right, wait, sorry, wait for the mic, I can't hear. Uh, okay. Um, so ju judging by the numbers that you described and the, the fact that Bitcoin is topped by 21 million Bitcoins, looks like th this is the driving factor behind Bitcoin's economy. Like that there are now, I checked, a total of about $35 billion in Bitcoins. So this is what drives the prices up. Uh, is Bitcoin, uh, is ransomware what's driving up the, uh, the, the value of Bitcoin? Yeah. I would, I would hope not, I hope not, but I don't know for a fact, but I guess, if the bad guys want to continue transacting in Bitcoins and there's more transactions, it probably has some amount. I hope it's not what's causing the all-time highs, but I really don't know. Uh, there's one over here. Of course, it's all the way across. <laughs> we'll, go, uh, we'll go two more questions and uh, then I'll be around to answer any more. So you are asking for a warranty for a web application firewall intrusion detection, whatever. Yes. Yeah. Um, but a warranty you can always request on uh, based on a contract. Yes. So aren't you excluding open source or freeware tools with this? Uh, yes. And that would. Uh, so the question is, by asking of let's say a commercial vendor for a warranty, which is something an open source project can't provide. Yes, and that would be one differentiator the commercial market could offer that open source would not be able to. Unless, there's really no reason why a commercial entity couldn't offer a warranty on an open source project if they wanted to. In the, at least in the US, I don't know how it works here, there are third party warranties you get, you can buy in consumer electronics like from Apple, the extended warranty. So you could do things like that. All right. Thank you very much everybody, have a great day. It's been my pleasure.